My name's Sam Taylor and I'm here with Tim McCourt and we're talking to Peter Dodd, um, who is an animator um, and somebody who I've um, been lucky enough to be friends with for um, quite a few years now. Since uh, 2004. Really? Wow, it's 10 years. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. uh, anyway, Peter is uh, an, uh, an animator, probably one of the um, best animators that I've ever come across uh, and he is somebody who's kind of uh, showed me a different kind of model of animation than anything that I um, was interested in up until the point at which I met you. I think uh, I was always into uh, sort of really loose expressionistic um, animation like Glenn Keane style uh -huh. uh, and I remember when you turned up uh, it was, we were working on The Illusionist um, yeah. by Sylvain Chimay up in Edinburgh. I've been there for a little while and you turned up and um, the way you draw I think is quite unique. It's quite um, it's quite slow and deliberate seemingly like to watch you work but then you're also one of the most incredibly fast animators that, uh, that I've ever come across and it's also you have a very light and soft touch with the pencil. I'm not uh, very exciting to watch <laughs> uh, for the documentaries. Yeah. <laughs> But you, but you, but you get it right first time, and your animation is so uh, um, just see, just seems to be like almost like you saw it there before you drew it to me. Oh, that's not at all the case. No, but it's nice of you to say so. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, um, I search for the drawing um, the same as Michelangelo does with his statues. Not that I'm comparing myself to Michelangelo, but but um, but he, he always said that in, within every marble, the statue is already there. You just have to find it. So I tend to sort of take the attitude of sculpting the drawings because I I came to animation really late. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did more. Well, I did a fine art course for three years, and I was always more interested in charcoal drawing. And uh, the way I used to draw was that everything would emerge as if out of a fog. I can't remember where I got that idea from, but you know, you put the charcoal on, you take a putty rubber, you take uh, the light yeah. turns off, mm. and, and, and you sort of gradually etch into it. And uh, usually when I draw, I sort of draw slightly with the side of the pencil, and I sort, right. of, um, sort of etch and etch and etch until it comes right. And uh, when I was working with uh, Joanna Quinn, one, one of the people there said that... Uh, uh, I, I tickle the paper with my pencil. <laughs> well, I think that so maybe always, that's what yeah. I wasn't explaining very well. <laughs> you, you, you have a light kind of uh, uh, drawing style. So I, uh, I, I, I'm not. Uh, yes, you're right. I'm the opposite of uh, Glenn Keane okay. later. Yes. So I'm, I'm not. I'm not at all sort of trendy in that sense. It's, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't call it well. Uh, <laughs> do you, uh, it's interesting that you were talking about sculpture though, because uh, I noticed on your LinkedIn in page that one of the quotes is. Uh, smooth rotating things are my jam. <laughs> are your what jam? Are my jam. jam. Well, well, yeah. One of my students uh, called Estelle uh, that I taught at Lincoln the last two years. She, I can't even remember why she said it. Uh, I, I did some sort of project recently where I did. Oh, I know. It was the TSB, the oh, TSB yeah, thing yeah, where it literally TSB it, 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 it's rotating things. Okay, yeah. Yes, Studio AK, TSB adverts. And the first two of them, well, on the third now, the first two of them were literally rotating people uh, in, in a CG environment. And when she saw it, she didn't know I'd done it. Uh, and she said, uh, was this you? Because um, rotating people, uh, <laughs> smooth rotating things are your jam. Uh, right, okay. So I thought I'd take that as a tagline. I think yeah. that's very good. <laughs> I mean, it's something that you, uh, you that was very clear in of all the animation that I've ever seen that you've done is you have a very good understanding of volume. Uh, I mean, from Prometheus, which was your... I think that's what did it. Short yeah, film. I think that's what did it. And where, did, where do you think that you get that from, like that? Uh, uh, because uh, I, I never considered myself a, a proper animator. Is that I, I considered myself more an illustrator who moves things. Right. Well, um, what would you consider a proper animator? Well, I, d I do really consider myself a proper animator mm. now. Not necessarily a good one, but, a, a, you know, but it, what, it moves. What but, um, yeah. Well, when Richard Williams gives his talks and yeah. talks about um, the anecdote with him and Milk Carl, you know, that it took him years and years, and Milk Carl eventually said, I think it was Milk 
Cole, uh, said, oh, you could be an animator. Oh, I think it was... You know the one that, I yeah, mean? Yeah, it was Ken Harris, I think, wasn't it? Was it Ken Harris? Oh, it's the guy, yeah, anyway, yeah. Anyway, one of the people he took into a studio, yeah. um, uh, I'm not particularly good at Richard Williams' history, but... Uh, and and the implication was that Richard Williams was a good draftsman already, which he was. But mm. but to take an animator took years and years and years to, mm. to actually make it move correctly. And um, and when I was making, for instance, Prometheus, I was I wanted to make the almost the polar opposite to what you should do in animation, which is which is the the, the sort of the squashy, the stretchy, the snappy. All of the rules I didn't think you necessarily had to obey them. But, mm. but what I was concerned about was to was to make it very illustrative and full of volume and structure, so that it almost looked like a moving statue. And had you so, done anything like that before you did your short film? No, that was you see that was in a way the first thing I ever did. It just took me so long to do it. Oh really? Uh, so you hadn't really animated before? Not a lot. Uh, I, I did a very um, short uh, co- evening course in animation. Uh, for six months, read a lot of books, used a line tester, uh, discovered. Year? When was that? What year was that? Oh, um, 1980. Uh, you find it on LinkedIn page. Yeah. <laughs> uh, late, late 1980s, I think. Okay. Uh, no, maybe maybe even early 1990s, I'm not sure. Well, your first job uh, here says it was in 1993. 1993, so yeah, early 1990s in that case, okay. yes. yes. Before, so before that, I was a sort of a failed artist, painter. Where did you study, because you studied fine art in New York? Uh, studied fine art in Sunderland, uh, did a foundation in St. Helens, Lancashire. Um, and you come from Annick, is that right? come from Annick in Northumberland, right. on the Scottish border. Um, went to St. Helens to take my foundation course for a year, because they wouldn't let me in anywhere else. <laughs> Um, and then they didn't let me in anywhere else for a year in my uh, BA course and then eventually I got into Sunderland in the pool section so I was always a last resort wherever I was taken um, and, and then they let me in and I, and I sort of for the first two years specialised in kind of draw, uh, portraits and life drawing and, and realistic drawing and then as the second year went into the third year and they sent me off to Africa for a scholarship I, wow. I became increasingly abstract and, and I finished with sort of six foot abstract paintings. Where did um, you go in Africa? The Ivory Coast. And how long were you out there for? Uh, a month, yeah. So, uh, and that, then my paintings became very colourful and full of uh, elephant tusks and oh, yeah. various abstract sort of symbols. But uh, I can recognise all the, uh, where, they, where they all come from, but nobody else can. So you, but, uh, so you finished the... Uh, fine art course and was there a period of time between that and you doing it? Yes, that? yes uh, uh, where I didn't know what on earth I was doing um, and I've always been a bad businessman so I couldn't sell anything and nobody really wanted to buy strange African abstract paintings um, and then a little course came along uh, and uh, just an evening course at Newcastle Polytechnic uh, and I happened to qualify for it, uh, did the course, and, and then uh, discovered that um, all the time I'd loved animation when I was a child uh, with, well, Disney films or whatever, uh, but I never assumed that I was capable of doing it particularly because it looked so difficult. Mm. And then I discovered as soon as you make a good key and another good key, then the rest is, um, well, relatively simple. And what did you do on that first course? We, uh, the, one of the tutors had bought some keys from a, a film that he'd worked on, um, which was about goblins, but I can't remember the title of it. Um, for, uh, it wasn't the BFG. Uh, no, he did work on the BFG, but it was for some the Goblin King or something, I can't remember. Mm. But anyway, it was... That it, it classic. Was, do you know it? No, no, no. no, no. Uh, uh, it was. I think it probably wasn't very really good. I never saw it anyway. But but um, but anyway, he had some drawings. We in between them. We learned how to in between. To be honest, that that side of things was relatively easy to do. And then uh, we were in, we spent the next three months of the course uh, making a short film uh, called Peter's Christmas Present, which is nothing to do with me, but uh, about a bad fairy. Um, um, uh, jumping open and ruining Christmas for everybody. Mm-hmm. 
and I animated some sequences in that. And Have you uh, looked at them since? Yes, yeah, it's horrible, but, but I mean, it, it wasn't too bad for total beginners. Right, yeah. And it was done on cell, so we, we sort of learned, you know, at the time what was the norm. We had an EOS line tester that rewound itself, uh, that you could do line tests, which took hours and hours to shoot. Uh, and then, yeah, we, we, we split ourselves into teams of animators and cell painters, and, and we made a, a five-minute film, which is, a, which is a small miracle, really. Wow. Uh, then we all got thrown out into the world, and uh, I know nobody else who's working in animation, but I mean, maybe they all are for all I know. But um, And you were still based in Newcastle at this time? Yes, yeah. Did and you then, feel very far away from the animation industry? Uh, yes, yes. I, 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 I did get a job immediately, almost immediately, with Sheila Graeber and a studio called Seen and Heard, who have probably uh, vanished from the face of the earth in Pink Lane. Huh? Where, where were they, they based? Pink Lane in Newcastle. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. We did an a, a educational film for doctors that was really selling a drug for senile dementia. And I did some, uh, some bad Photoshop work for, for a bad, uh, <laughs> embarrassingly bad educational film for, for doctors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And from that, yes, I felt very far away from London, and then I went with my folder underneath my arm, booked myself five days in London, and started knocking on people's doors to try and get a job. Oh, right, so you went, you just, just thought, I'm going straight to London after that? I, I didn't live there, I just took a trip. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and, and said, please hire me. Um, I made a, I took a VHS videotape with me that I edited together in the college mm. for the line test from the film, some I'd done in my spare time. Uh, made it up to about uh, two and a half minutes, uh, put it on VHS, uh, took lots of live drones with me, and then started knocking on everybody's door. And Where did you think Luckily, uh, Simonetti, I remember, uh, and Brian Stevens, who actually recognised me 20 years later. I met him at the memorial with John Coates uh, recently, and strangely enough, he recognised me. And wow. he's the one who offered me my first job, and unfortunately, I had to reject it. Oh, wow. Because maybe that's why you did, maybe that's why you did. <laughs> rejection. But he was he was a very nice man, I, and, and uh, he offered me. And, and unfortunately, I, I uh, rejected that for a job in Paris because Paris seemed more exotic right. at the time. Was that animated? Isn't it? Well, uh, I was told when I um, before I left that. The Brian Stevens job was an educational film again for children, and then they told me in Paris uh, that my name had been taken from a, literally pulled out from a hat. I'd put my name in about uh, a couple of months earlier, and uh, there was a central organisation called Cartoon in in Brussels that, that did a sort of an animation exchange. They uh, then paired jobbing animators with studios that required uh, fairly free labour. And there was this tiny, tiny little studio in Paris, and they decided I could go there. Uh, they didn't tell me what it was, except the title. Was that Central Building? That was Central Building, yes. They told me it was uh, from uh, a graphic novel by Philip Bertrand, who was a famous French uh, graphic novelist, that I didn't really know. Uh, but they said it was for adults, and I, and I thought that's great because at the time I was uh, in my 20s, uh, late 20s, and I, I'd, I'd sort of uh, thought I've already had enough of Disney singing songs and that I would quite like to do something a little bit more mature. But when I, I didn't realise it was actually uh, porn. <laughs> porn. Porn, yeah. <laughs> it is now online, I put it online. If Whoa. You to it. Um, um, and they, they, they took me, and I didn't know what I was going to be doing, but, but they didn't uh, particularly <laughs> trust me initially, but they said, here, have a, look at, um, have a look at these graphic novels that he's done. And they were graphic. And they were very graphic, yes. Yes, there wasn't a lot of work done sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> so we, we, we worked up as at the uh, cemetery in Montparnasse, and I was given a flat, uh, the ninth floor of the ninth arrondissement near the Sacre Coeur, and I had a very kind of exotic but poor life for a couple of months while they, while they gave me um, scraps of stuff. And initially, because I was English, they thought I wasn't capable of drawing anything, uh, to put it in his words, hot. 
Uh, so they, so they, they, they put me on props. Right. Uh, and initially, my first prop was a stiletto shoe, and my second prop was a teddy bear with a spiky chastity belt. Right. Um, and so I continued just drawing objects, um, and eventually, the guy that draw drew the uh, the sort of saucier turnarounds uh, got a cold or got ill somehow looking at too many magazines but but uh, and and um and there was nobody else so they said okay let the englishman ever go and because uh you know they, they thought all englishmen are cold and um which is possibly true in my case but but they they, <laughs> they, 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 th- they thought i was incapable of drawing um uh bottoms for a start they said they said are you sure you can draw bottoms and i said well i you know, I can do life drawing. I, can, I, I have drawn quite a few bottoms. And they said, but can you draw a sexy bottom? And I said, well, I'll have a go. Uh, so they gave it to me. And uh, luckily, luckily, he looked at the turnaround and he, and he said, uh, this doesn't sound real, but he did say, ooh la la, it's hot. Wow. Uh, so so um, did he have a berry? Yeah. <laughs> he, 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 was, he spoke exactly like Antoine de Are you Corn. sure this wasn't all a dream? <laughs> no, no. no. Um, uh, he spoke exactly like Antoine de Corn. Really? From Europe Trash. Yes. Oh, okay. yes, yes. So he became, he was very, very, very much a cliche. Right. Uh, but, but I liked him a lot. And, um, and did you feel like a cliche of an Englishman there? Oh, yes. Did you feel like yes. you were quite reserved? Yes, and, yes exactly. Yeah. Yes, I turned into one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, uh, I drank tea at every opportunity. And, and this is the director? <laughs> uh, that was the director, yes. He, he hadn't really... Uh, I, I say he was, I really liked him, but, but he hadn't a clue about animation. And as a result, he would examine every single drawing that you did. Not the movement, just the drawings. Mm. Um, and um, Was there a lot of girls working there? Was it all... Yes, yes. Blokes? No, no, no. All perms, did you say? I said, was it all pervy blokes? All pervy blokes. blokes. Uh, yeah, well... Um, no, uh, a lot of girls, um, and it didn't bother them in the slightest. Right. No, they didn't take, uh, they didn't regard it as, as the slightest bit of an issue. To, and was the film, it, it, I haven't seen the film, is it, is it sort of exploitative, or is it kind of, you know, how does it represent sort it, of women it's sort of the, the, men? The, 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 the closest I thought of initially was the Kenny Everett character, Cupid Stunt. You know um, where you don't you remember you don't know. too young. I'm not Kenny that, but, but it was it was um, there was a comedian called Kenny Everett. Right. And he used to used to wear a miniskirt. He still had a beard underneath his wig, right. and and he and it was about a um, uh, um, a girl that, that was a star in sex movies, but it was on family day to, daytime TV, and it, so it was full of double entendres, including the name. Right, right, right. And it, it, it was always the difference. And all my clothes fell off. You know, the, right, there right. was a breeze, and all my clothes fell off. And it was very much like that. The slightest mm-hmm. opportunity, and the clothes would fall off. Mm-hmm. But you, it never. F- <sighs> you can watch it. It's. It, 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 I did put it up, and it, it's. It's so in your face uh, that it. It kind of makes you laugh more than it makes you. Right. Okay. More than it makes you aghast. How long is it? Is it like feature? It, no, it's it's uh, it's called funky drama clips for post adolescents, and each one is three minutes. Oh, okay. What 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 are we talking about now? A central building, that the thing I was making in front. So what's funky drama? Clips? That's what it's subtitled. Central oh, building, right, funky okay. drama clips for post adolescents. Okay. Right. And it's it's just it's three minute pieces, and there was there was about uh, thirteen episodes, and it went on at midnight just before the bullfighting on Canal Plus on French TV. Wow. Wow. So it was designed for sort of adolescence, but it had a very surrealist edge. Okay. Say it looked like Tintin, but it was soft porn uh, with uh, an element of surrealism to it. It was. Well, did it look strange. good? Like no, no. It didn't. I mean, it, <laughs> it, 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 it was. Uh, I'm not proud of it. I mean, as I said, I was young and inexperienced, but like Marilyn Monroe when she started, you know. So. <laughs> um, uh, 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 I did it for it the was money. Like, it was your casting. That was my yes, yes. <laughs> that's right. Yes. So, um, so no, it didn't look. Good. And now it would be done very much better in Flash. It right. looks like it was. It was very limited, but but yeah. I still look back with a lot of nostalgia. So you came back from France and you you couldn't put any of that on your show, Rob. Well, I uh, I did actually. Um, oh really? And yeah, and um, well, they sent me off to. 
they sent me off to Germany. I've skipped a few stages, really. They made me do storyboards, then character turnarounds. Then they sent me off to Germany. Uh, well, this is Potsdam. the same company. Oh, this is the same this company. Is a cartoon. Well, in this, uh, well uh, sorry if this seems complicated, but no. uh, cartoon sort of employed me for uh, a couple of months in Paris. I love how creative they got with the name there. <laughs> what? I love how creative they got with the name. Cartoon. We're an animation cartoon. company. Yeah. What can we call cartoon ourselves? Brussels. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cartoon Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they sent me off to Paris. The Paris people paid for my flat and I was paid £150 a week for my salary, which was fine. Uh, then, luckily, they liked what I did, and they kept me on. They, they just did the the pre production in Paris. Mm. Uh, they kept me on for the character designs, then the storyboards, and then once that period was over, they extended me for another month. And then they decided that they'd like to send me to Germany, to, to Potsdam, near Berlin, to to do some animation on mm. the actual series. Oh right. So that that was that was really my first animation gig. Once they sent me to Germany. Okay. Um, and uh, then yes you asked if I could put it on my reel I sort of did and bizarrely enough the next job I got was for uh, a Christian organisation uh, <laughs> on, on a children's film uh, <laughs> for, the, for the nativity story that's cool <laughs> that's cool <laughs> Bible stories Bible stories for Christmas, Christmas. Christmas. Yes. Whoa. Yes. Yes. Oh my and where God. was that? Where? Yeah. Where? Bevan Field Films in London, that was. Wow, yes, okay. yes. Wow. And that was the case of... And, and did, were you sat there in the meeting room while they looked over your... Uh, <laughs> no, Toulouse Lutre, uh, no. Toulouse Lutre period. Yeah. Of, uh, <laughs> no, this, again, they, it, was, it was quite a while before... Do, 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 what was it? I think, yes, I sent my first stuff to them and then, then they sent me off to Germany. By the time I finished in Germany, they'd given me a couple of months later a call to say are you still available so mm. it was a few months between me handing my stuff right. and then replying which mm. is why I always say to the students um, if people give you that Dear John letter uh, we put you on file sometimes they literally do and they, they do call you up months I later you know so right, yeah. so yeah then they called me up and then, mm. I, and then I came here and I did the Bible stories and uh, were you were you religious at this point? no oh, right, no yeah. I'd given it up uh, five years before. Okay. So in in a way, I I uh, people call me a commercial whore these days because I because <laughs> I because I work in the commercial world. But I regard myself much more on principle because I made two biblical things. Uh, I, I made porn, which I have no objection to. <laughs> I, I sell I sell anything. I, I'm prepared to sell anything, which I have no objection to, which I can explain later if you want. But um and and but actually the most unprincipled things I ever did was do work on two religious things. <laughs> Because I'm not religious, so uh, yeah. Wow. Um, and there was, was there a slightly different atmosphere at the animation studio where you were making Bible stories Bible versus stories. Central uh, Building? Uh, I worked out actually. Okay. I worked out of studio, and then they went bankrupt. Okay. They did one more thing with me, which was which was a Alexi Sale voiced uh, public information films about Don't Play with Fire. Right. Which I had to make it, which literally I had to do five minutes in three weeks all on my lonesome. Wow. And then, and then How, after that. So again, five minutes. Five minutes in, in three weeks, which was my, my sort of economical phase, what well, I had to be. Yeah. Um, and it was about, well, it was just two characters. Um, so lots of, so I, I have no idea how I did it. I could never do it now. But yeah, five minutes in three weeks, and now it takes, well, I mean, you know, mm. working for something. Uh, kind of like the illusionist, you do seven seconds a week or something. Yeah, that's one thing. Like yeah. that always interests me about um, uh, your work is that you know I met you only a couple of years back, yeah. and the standard of your animation is so. I mean, it's it's at the highest level, looking like feature. I think you know, like very uh, volumetric and uh, creative, and the like, performances are great. But you you. It, you haven't worked on many features, is that right? Probably four or something. And were they, uh, but like how? But usually you see people like that, uh, people of that standard, or people who are not even of that standard, and they've all they've done is just kind of gone through that kind of feature thing. Whereas, what what year was your first feature you worked on? Uh, well, that was the, the other religious one I worked on, which was um, uh, the Miracle Maker. 
Well, the Jesus story. No, the Miracle Maker was renamed, which mm. is horrible. Um, uh, and um, that was my first uh, film, which, uh, <laughs> which was almost totally cut out, everything I did. Um, what year was that? Uh, was this uh, like a kind of... I mean, I've never heard of it or anything. No, you never this. will. Uh, I mean, you can find uh, the video cover online, I think. And mm. if, you, if, you, if you go to a certain religious organisations, they're still selling it. Right. Um, was it a good looking film at all? Like that? No, no, well, I, I really don't think so. It was, there, was a, there was a TV series uh, which was based on Old Testament stories, and some of them were quite good. They, they, they mixed them, and there was off, they were often done by uh, Russian animators. Mm. And you had uh, uh, Alexander Petrovich sort of stuff uh, mm. with experimental styles, some puppet stuff, and they decided to get um, a mixture between uh, a Welsh production and a Russian production. And the Russian production did the puppet side of things, and the Welsh production did all of the uh, the flashback sequences mm. uh, on two D. So that's that's what they were doing in uh, in Cardiff or Cardiff and Cymru. Right. Um, and that was in I, I, I don't know the date. I mean, in, again, mid nineties, I guess. Okay. Yeah, it, um, I think it must have been. I think it must have been ninety six or seven or something. Uh, yes, but you're right. I mean, I did more TV specials uh, mm. at first than films. Yeah. I did a, a, a few TV specials in the dying days of TVC. And right. then then I did little bits here and there. Was that... Um, what's TVC? Is that TV cartoons. It was the one that did the... the well, it started off on the Yellow Submarine and then, the, the, you know, the, the, the best known for the Starman and the right. Father mm. Christmas. And did you work on... Then, uh, um, you worked on Be- the Bear, right? The Bear, yes, yeah. yes. Famous Fred was the first one oh, where yeah, I got yeah. my first what, what I would say was my big break mm. um, for Joanna Quinn. Yeah, it was her first half hour special. Yeah, yeah. It's um, about the, the cat's funeral. About the cat. Yeah, Lenny Henry was the uh, was the voice of the cat in mm. the in the in the vein of Barry White. There was a lot of big name voices. Yeah, uh, and Tom Courtney. Yeah. Not everybody said of Tom Courtney, but he was, he was very good. He did the Camp Guinea Pig character, yeah. which so is the character I was given. So, so that was a 30-minute uh, film, right? 30-minute, yeah, 30-minute TV special, because, mm. of course, not many films are made in this country, mm. obviously. And, mm. um, so and that came out in 1996, so you'd... 96, yes. So you'd only been working in animation for about five years at that point. No, less... Yeah, less. Uh, that was oh, one of you, my first you, jobs. You've been working for three years in animation, and that was in abroad. Is that right? Uh, no, no, just uh, not even years. Um, I'd been working just a few months. Okay, uh, but you did famous script. Yeah, and then oh, wow. uh, so I did. Uh, a f- uh, I did my porn, my Christian, uh, <laughs> my children's stuff. And then, Whoa, uh, if and someone then, had just tuned into that, yeah, so my poor, my Christian, and children, for uh, working in, on cats. Yes, before working on uh, before working on cats. Yes, um, and then I heard from my tutor that the that, that uh, TVC, who normally obviously were London based, had decided to, to set up a unit in Cardiff with Joanna Quinn, and I loved Joanna Quinn and mm. still do, and. And I thought, well, I'll never be allowed on this with my 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 uh, dubious past, <coughs> even though it was only a few months. But all I did was ring them up and say, uh, I didn't know how else to do it. I just said, do you happen to need any animators? Even though I shouldn't have been asking that, I should have worked my way up from being an assistant or, oh, yeah. or something, but I didn't know that. And I said, do you need any animators? And they said, well, yes, we do. Uh, Katrina was, was the producer who was kind enough to give me the chance maybe she didn't know but um, she said yes we do uh, do you animate and I said yes I do and she said okay we'll send you a test I did the test and they liked it and they ended up using it in the film oh wow really yeah how long was the test oh it was just a few um, 
it was just about seven seconds. It was a guinea pig with his trousers falling down, which was excellent for me, given that I'd done so many pants falling down <laughs> in the past few months. <laughs> we need a man who knows about trousers falling down. Oh, yeah. Did anybody yeah. heard about this guy? He's easy, easy. He's pants by this time, yeah. Uh, um, but it, was that a funny noise? I was, I was more of a scared lifter than a trouser driver at that stage, but uh, yes. But was it more common in um, the 90s to do test projects? It still is common, I think. Really? I mean, I've, I've, like, I've been... I've heard that only... I think in longer couple. projects it is. Like maybe like TV... Maybe not for commercials. Not for commercials, really, yeah. no. But, but for... I mean, I've almost always tested for films or, mm. or even for TV series or... Yeah, very frequently, very frequent to do that. Still is, really. It's funny, it's, I suppose it's like auditioning or something, isn't it? It's kind of like auditioning, yeah. But a long, much longer process. Yes, yes. I mean, luck, if you're lucky, um, hopefully they only ask you for a day. And then yeah. that's not taking the mickey too much. No. But you some, was, some, the test you used to do unpaid completely. It's unpaid, yeah. Mm. I've never been paid for a test. I always find it funny that they can. Well, you're going to say that that they yeah. can use it in the film. Yeah, it's a bit cheap. Ah, no, nah, that's okay. That's okay. In this case, uh, I have to speak of the noble John Coates. Mm. Is that they did pay me for it anyway? Oh right. Uh, okay. And because uh, it was based on footage. Right. And they, they made sure they paid it. Uh, they paid me for it, but they forgot that they paid me for it. And I remember catching on when told me that um, she'd been talking to John Coates after the, it had all finished and the budget had all gone yeah. and she would said oh yeah Peter did that as his test and he said well did he get paid for it and she said oh I don't know and he said, he said well you bloody well better make sure he did yeah. but they had you know. Mm, but, right, but it was right. nice that they, both she had thought of paying me for it yeah. and he'd actually made that specific point mm. as well so yeah they were totally fair about but it, it. It's kind of, but it it's kind of oh you mean generally a, it's kind of a shrewdness to think that like okay we're going to hand out tests and then hand out scenes that ah, we're going to go in ah the... yes well it wasn't initially intended to be used oh, like okay. that one they just, that's like it, saying that every animator would be given that shot. every animator was given the same scene okay, yeah. it, it, sometimes I wonder yeah, because yeah. when I was living in the south of France uh, later on there was a production uh, <laughs> I don't mention I suppose but um where everybody was required to do... It was virtually a week of, of testing. And mm. as far as I know, people got different scenes and it slightly worried me mm. that they were just <laughs> taking yeah, people to work for a f- week free using their tests and making the film from that. I, 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 I hope it wasn't the case. But, but and you but, did that, did you? No, I didn't. I, I refused because... Okay. Uh, I mean, luckily I wasn't so desperate at the time, yeah. but... But it's a horrible thought that, that, that you could work on something for a week for no money and then not even get it. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. an even more horrible thought to think if you actually went to see the film, which you probably couldn't afford to, mm. uh, that they might actually have your scene. Yeah. But um, whether that ever happens, I don't know. That was a bit paranoid. I'm, but, I'm sure. But I think any more than I'm a sure day. There's always like shysters in it. Maybe, yeah. Story. Yeah. But, but, but anything more than a day, I, I, I think, is a bit objectionable, really. But I also uh, feel like you should reach a certain point in your career where your showreel just speaks for itself. I mean, I can't think of yes. a better showreel than yours. Yeah, to, uh, I mean, I suppose it's... And it's also very various. I mean, you've done so much different mm. stuff on your... Um, the reel that's up on Vimeo at the moment, it all seems to be... Trying to think. Seems to be in there. I mean, I suppose... I did, yeah, you, I mean, hmm. I, th- there's two features I didn't have to test for, and that was Zarafa and Mia and the Migu. Right. Oh, yeah. Because Mia, which was the, the first proper film I regarded working on, because I, I was there from the very beginning to the very end. Okay. And then they saw... That was I'm made sk- up. I'm skipping way ahead here, but, yeah. but uh, they saw Prometheus, which I made before that, and right. in the festival, and they asked me to work for them, and that's how I got that job, so mm-hmm. I didn't test for that one, yeah. And um, so, uh, at what point did you start making Prometheus then? Was that. Ah, yes, Prometheus. Because it took quite a long time to make. Uh, yes, yes. Prometheus is your short film. Yeah. Prometheus is my, my very long short film, yeah. 
How long is it? 12 minutes? Uh, it's 13 minutes long and it took 13 years to do it. Yes. Uh, although that's since been beaten by Neil Boyle, who just released The Last Bell, which took him 20, no, 15 years, I think, to do it. Yeah, right. But neither of you were working full time. No, it has to be said. No, it's it's uh, it wasn't um, it wasn't exactly a minute a year. No, we we uh, we weren't working full time. Neil was working on Space Jam when he started his, and he did it as light therapy, which I'm sure he'll tell you when you interview him. <laughs> and uh, and I did it because uh, I got chucked out um, of my animation course. When I was initially looking for work and having a bit of difficulty was during uh, one of the animation sessions where uh, Cosgrove Hall had just um, thrown lots of people out from, I don't know, Count Docula or Danger Mouse or something. Mm. And as a result, lots of experienced animators had gone, uh, had oversaturated the market and I was nobody. And therefore I couldn't get a job, which is why I ended up in France. Uh, every time I can't get a job, I end up in France. And you therefore, speak fluent French, don't you? Uh, now, but then I didn't. Now I do. But then when did you learn that? Uh, that? On Mia and Migu. Okay. I was really? To. Okay. So, so on the porn film, you didn't. On you? the porn film, I I was clumsily trying to. Right. Okay. Uh, but but they got so frustrated they just spoke English to me. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes, the, the, so well, I couldn't get a job. Uh, I started. Uh, I thought the only way is to make my own film and then at least I've made a film and at least I can use it as a demo reel, as a calling card. And I thought everybody made their own film, which (laughs) which isn't true. And uh, so I applied for a script grant from uh, Northern Arts. They kindly gave me a little piece of money to to write a script. And I went and studied in a musty old uh, library with antiquated books for about six months, uh, came up with a script based on uh, an old, a very, very old play, one of the oldest in the world that is known. Which is Prometheus. Which is Prometheus, Prometheus Bound by Aeschylus. Uh, and then uh, just as that started rolling and, and I got a little bit of a, a little bit more money, they liked the script and they decided I could make it into a film. They gave me a little bit more cash. And just as that came in, I started getting some jobs. So, as a result, uh, it took me six months to do the script and it took me oh, forever to do the rest of it. Uh, but I just had to pick away at it mm. in between jobs. Um, and then I rejected many good jobs. Um, and then got fed up with it for a couple of years, never wanted to touch it again. And yeah, so, but eventually stopping and starting and, and uh, having the equivalent of animation nervous breakdowns, then and yeah. eventually 13 years later it came out, yes. And, and that must have been so difficult because in that 13 years, your growth must have been incredible. <laughs> like, did you have to, did you redo any of yeah, Is there anything that you started? Like at the beginning, that's well, the trouble is, I constantly kept redoing bits, but mm. but but I had to leave it eventually. The, the problem is, if you don't have a deadline, you just keep going forever. Yeah, and that was my problem is nobody ever said stop. <laughs> and I, I mean, it, it ended up that I just ran out of money to such a grave extent that I just sort of have to call it a day on this. Um, and you actually gave up at one point, didn't you? Oh, totally so, gave up. Yes, yes. I didn't want to touch a pencil again for about a year after. After, yeah, and I never animated. I ended up working in a stock room in Habitat. Really? Yeah. Was that after year what? And that was yeah. after you finished the film, right? Uh, just after I'd finished it, I just got totally fed up with it. Uh, did luckily, um, uh, my wife Sally uh, entered it into festivals for me. I wouldn't have got anywhere. Oh, wow. uh, but um, and I wouldn't have had the job in France probably either. But but. Um, but I just got totally fed up with animation, um, working night and day on something that I thought nobody was ever going to see. Uh, it had totally bankrupted me, ended really? up in it with a huge debt. Oh. I thought I could have had a house with this, I could have had a car with this, you know, but instead I've got a film no one's ever going to watch. And do you feel now that it was worth it? Uh, now I do, yes. yes. Ten what years what later, year did yes. you finish it? 2004 uh, I finished it. Okay, right. And what yeah, so the... it, it, it took a huge chunk of... So your um, advice to somebody who is currently like, say, seven years into (laughs) 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 13 years, would you tell them to give up or would you tell them to finish it? 
Uh, I don't know. I'd say don't start to start with, probably. But, but the, well, I'd say... For God's but you're sake, happy with it, and you're glad that you... No, I'm glad I did it now. I'm glad I did it now, yes. It was, it was ridiculously stupid, and I never would have ever started it had I known. Um, if someone was seven years into it, I, I suppose it depend what stage they're at, is either cut your losses. You know, if they were just at the beginning. Because there's a lot of people with... with with films that have been working out a long time, but it's not that far progressed. Yeah, I met, I worked with someone and I was talking to them about a film and they were like, oh yeah, I'm making this film. And I was like, oh, how long have you been making it? And they were like 10 years. And it was like they started it when they yeah. graduated and it was still work. Yeah. I found that absolutely astonishing. Yes. Like that. Um, yeah, it, it, it might, it, it's quite possible that it might never get finished and therefore... <clears throat> You know, and as you say, your, your style might have changed so much, mm. or your ideas. You know, you, you, it, it's kind of hard to keep an idea on the boil for such a long oh period of God, time. Because, yeah. it, which is why I didn't do a comedy. <laughs> you know, because I thought it's not going to be funny by the end of it. <laughs> but you didn't know surely starting it. No, I, take, I didn't. I didn't know it was going to take that long. No, but, but, but I, thought, I thought it was going to take six months. Oh, right, and, right, and I right. thought, well, I'm not going to be laughing at the end of six months. So, yeah. so I'll, I'll. That's one thing that kind of. It blows my mind about porn animation it's like <laughs> I mean like can that guy really like he's been working on that film for a year still think things are hot like yes yes he, he got um, he got a free song every time he saw something did you really yes yes wow. he got a what? yes a free song <laughs> that's not he was the, the, uh, the French speaker down the back of his neck oh, right. Right. Um, yes he used to break out in a sweat when he used to like something wow but I, he wasn't doing to... the animation himself no, no, he was doing. Uh, oh he was God. doing the rough sort of. He was doing the uh, the rough um, boards and the rough character designs, and he would say to me, uh, "Find me twelve positions where people can have sex in a bizarre manner." And um, you're like, "You're the Frenchman." <laughs> and I said, "Yeah." And I came up with something. I mean, for that that particular time, I failed him badly because I had. I, uh, <laughs> He, he was aiming for something a little bit more perverse and down to earth, and I and I had people. I had people. I had someone. I had someone bonded onto a bed, and the, and the, and the guy on the ceiling with a spring on his back. Um, and, he, and he said, "No, no, that's really too much." Uh, but 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 um, it's yes, so like I'm with some dark stuff. So, <laughs> well, I ended up going to slapstick, and he he wanted right. slightly darker and more and more right. dodgy. And I didn't have the dark edge that he did. Um, yes, but but when he gave me the uh, the curvy sensual parts, the the caressing parts of the yeah. animation, that's when he that's when he enjoyed watching the animation the most. That is and so weird. Did the crew man. <laughs> that is so weird. Like that he actually. So you're saying he was like if a good like reaction to it for him is if you could see him getting a bit turned on. By it. Yes, yes, he would loosen his collar and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, thing and he, would, he, would, he would actually wave his hand against his face and, uh, and he actually said he got loud. So. Oh, Jesus it's, Christ, it's man! Funny, I man. wish I'd love, I'd oh, man, I'd love to have seen that. That is so funny. So, I, but, but even comedy as well. Like I do wonder how people do um, um, do kind of. I, I don't think I've ever really animated comedy. I don't know how people kind of keep their their heads in there over long periods of time doing comedy performances uh, no well you did sort of you know with the illusionist I suppose it was very very subtle uh, it wasn't laugh out loud it was, no it wasn't laugh out loud no, no it's like it that's very things. drill yes. Is that, yeah yes there wasn't so many laugh out loud moments there but but, but it's, it's kind of the same in a way it's, it's, uh, you, you know when people say that comedy is harder to write or comedy is harder to perform and, and it's very very obvious when you fail um, and you imagine, and Mockham and Wise apparently, uh, a bit of a diversion, but Mockham and Wise apparently used to rehearse it to death before they got it right. Right. Uh, it, it sort of feels like that. Yeah, you know, you usually work people with tour, the director. Uh, you know, stand up comedy tour a show for a year, don't they? Yes, Quite yes. Often. And you get the odd, you, 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 you think that he's making it up on yeah. the spot, and I suspect he's just revising what he already knows. Yeah, yeah. I've heard it's, I heard it's uh, bizarrely. Uh, consistent his uh, his show possibly yes uh, I went to see Ken Dodd when I was working in Butlins during my um, one of my off times and he kept going for about three hours and we didn't get out till about two o'clock in the morning or something yeah. and um, and you definitely got the impression that he was he had 
been going for 40 years on the same routine, but but on the other hand, he knew it so well that he was just improvising it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was so polished that he knew exactly when to hit yeah. the right notes. Mm -hmm. And it sort of feels the same when you're working with an animation director who knows what they're doing with comedy, is that, you know, they just know exactly when to remove a frame or when to give that slight difference of regard. I mean, I'm doing, it, I'm doing the TSB ad and it's much more comedic, this one. It's not the spinning people, it's, it's actually a fixed camera. And it's much more performance-based and it's about a waiter who keeps teasing this girl with a cake and then pulling it away at the last moment and to actually get that sort of tease quite right mm. you know is it sometimes you know usually you sort of over animate it you know as mm. we did in the illusionist and you do this little clever little curve of the head and this little sneer mm. and very often the director will just pull you back and say no i want to see the sneer but not the head movement and therefore mm. keep pulling it back and keep removing drawings until you've just got that sneer mm. yeah. and then at the very last moment hold it hold it hold it and then pull back you know right. So, yeah. who's the director on that one? Steve Small. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, there's some, one thing I wanted to ask you. I guess we've already touched on it slightly, um, but uh, the the thing about the um, three dimensionality of your work, the the volume that you yeah. get in things, and the rotating cameras and all that kind of stuff. How? Um, uh, it's so beautiful to watch and it's never endingly fascinating to, to see that like a human brain can do that kind of thing <laughs> but I also kind of um, think that a lot of people look at it and and feel like what's the point of spending all that much time doing it when you can do it in 3D now yes that was asked uh, several times when I did uh, when, Prometheus. when Prometheus came out is the bit with the mountains mm. when it zooms in on three occasions and uh, it, it sort of travels around him and it travels around his head and his body and the mountains themselves and they said why didn't you actually do that in CG uh, and there was one was uh, one was naivety one reason one was economics and one was uh, aesthetics and I'm never sure which which was the most I also get a sense with you that you is like a challenge as well yeah so I, I just I to see if the you most, can do well, it well the, the funny thing is, when I made that film, I, I, I thought, it's a story of a guy stuck on a rock that doesn't move, and it's not really that suited to animation. Um, and, and bizarrely, you'd never choose to do an animated subject about a guy that's stuck in one place and can't even move his arms and his legs. Um, that could have been a really easy. It could have been a, f a fantastically easy. You know, you couldn't have got any easy. You know, you could, I could have had a lip sync with just a couple of positions on the mouth and a bit of flappiness for the hair, and then that, that could have been it. You know, yeah. with a bit of flashbacks. But I thought that might look a bit boring. <laughs> but but I thought the first thing is it has to be voyeuristic and it has to sort of seem to dwell upon him. You know, so I thought, okay, he's fixed, and therefore the camera has to move around him. And then how do I do that best? Well, I have to make it volumetric, as you say. So I had to construct three separate models, you know, in clay. Oh, did you really do that? Yeah, so I did one for the head so that I could, I could move it at any angle. Um, and I did one of the body in the crucified position. And did and you actually the... photograph them? or just? No, no, them? I just turned them around in my hand okay. or put them on a plinth. Mm -hmm. I never photographed them because I was, I was ridiculously puritanical about it. Right. So I did thumb measurements, you know. Right. Um, and so all the perspective was calculated the very very old fashioned way I mean I'm not that puritanical now at all right. but, what, but what do you mean like you calculated it well, when I, you was drawing it yes really? yes yes. so, so uh, I'd, I'd, I'd take the model I'd put it in front of me I'd do several key poses in very very rough hmm. uh, test them when it looked right then I'd do them very very clean and then then I'd uh, do in betweens, and then I'd do. Then I'd sort of snip them, rescotch them to give it to give it the proper curve. Some take back, some take back on again. Uh, redraw the whole lot, and then go back and redraw the hair. And I'd have to number each strand of hair because there was about you know fifteen of them or something with little you know seven sections in each one. Mm. So it got quite complicated, which I hadn't intended in the first place. You know, with, but, but were any of those techniques but, things that you had experience with no, before no, no, not you at all. came up no, you were kind I, of I, inventing I decided it. I'll do it that way uh, out of naivety you know and, and, and because that, that was the point of the thing is that, is that I wanted it to look like a mix between a, a, a classical 
red or black figure vase with the frieze-like aspect and a mix of the design of the, the frieze-like vases in profile, but to give it volume, I, I studied the statues of the time. Therefore, I thought I'd better build myself a statue. Mm. Uh, so I wanted a cross between a 2D and a 3D look, but I thought to do it 3D at the time, things have changed, but at the time all the 3D stuff I saw looked like it was, um, looked like the animation was a slave to the software. In other words, it looked like I could not tell who'd animated a flyover or, or a mm. certain a certain scene because you had that slight underwater look or you had... You know, it's very easy to do a sort of a flyover. And it didn't even look like a helicopter. I thought it didn't even look realistic. It looked exactly like what it was. It looked like a series of key points with a curve added, moving over a fake landscape. You're talking about 3D uh, mm. software-generated stuff. Yes, yeah. yes. It's changed now, but at, but at mm. the time, you know, there's no camera jiggle, no nothing. And I thought, mm. well, the only way I'm going to get imperfections is to animate it myself. Mm. I didn't trust anyone to particularly... I couldn't do it myself. I didn't really think anyone would come up with the right look f for me. And I didn't think I'd be able to translate it properly into 2D. And I thought the only way to get it right, that, that every frame is within my own composition, is, is to do every single drawing by myself. So all camera moves and all, all rotations, I decided just to do in camera. Mm. And did you ever, like, how much of the time do you think you were enjoying yourself while you were doing that? Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> it was love hate at the same time. I would say right. I, I loved it and I hated it at the very same time. I loved it. I loved. Was there it days when you were just like, I love this so much? This yes. Is, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Definitely. Uh, there were days where I thought I can't take this anymore. I want nothing more to do with it. But when I found the the look of you know, if I once I saw. You know the little playback of the head rotating and the and the, and the and the wind flapping and then, and then I discovered the um, the effect I could get through diffusing the line and getting the the look of the grain. And you treated getting it in that Photoshop. Is that right? In Photoshop, yeah. So I scanned it in and then used a kind of a duotone. So there's only four colours ever ever in it. It was just a mixture of the four colours, which I thought gave a more unified, earthy look. And then added the, the grain, which was basically the paper, which was, which was cycled. And then the line was reproduced about 15 times and gradually diffused so that it looked like it was bleeding into the paper. Uh, and then a gradual series of opaque washes were added on top of that. Um, and various filters that, that, it, that it looked. I wanted it to look as simple as possible, but it was quite complicated to get it there. Mm. And I wanted it to, to have a very aged effect, a bit like if you actually filmed... Uh, an ancient vase uh, knew every frame mm, yeah. and I thought that created that nice sort of look of, uh, of uh, the thing I like about film noir or, or old grain films which is to create a filter between you and what you're watching I, I don't like high definition so much because it doesn't feel like you're actually it feels like you're too much in the room rather than a, a slight mm. removal from the yeah, I, 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 I used to be like that. I used to be like, I don't care about any of that stuff. But now watching stuff, standard definition, um, I do, I really do definitely notice the difference. And I do, um, I, I don't know. I always go to, because you, quite a lot of the time people don't have a pro account with Vimeo. Like oh, when it's embedded, no. you see it SD. I always uh, go to the page to see yeah. it. I go to Vimeo to see oh, it, high definition. You're... Definitely what I wasn't saying, by the way, is that I don't like high definition. Oh, right. I, I do like high definition. Okay. Now that now that it's filmed with high definition cameras and all the depth of field. Yes. Where stuff isn't but feeling like... what I meant was at the time it was more of a video look. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 didn't, it, it was a choice between a video look, which you often got when you went digital with a very clean line, a bit of pixelation around the edges. Or I, want, I thought, well, the only way I can avoid that, that it looks good on a big screen, is to diffuse it and make it a bit more filmic. Mm. And, and that, that, that way I added a bit of grain, because mm. I like grainy films. And, and, and now you're pretty much, uh, am I right in saying that you're pretty much exclusively working digitally? Yes, now. Yeah. But that's only changed the last eight months. Okay. And I didn't touch digital before that at all. I, yeah. Uh, you're, you're one of the... Um, uh, yeah, you were one of the last holdouts in uh, in two D. Yes, um, and you were able to get work. I mean, that wasn't the reason that you switched over, was it? I mean, you were getting plenty of work. Uh, well, I was, but I must admit, if I hadn't made the switch, I'm not sure I would have done. 
Okay. Uh, I've since, you know, the Simpsons thing that was done on pencil and paper and a couple of things, but but it was the perfect time to switch over. But I hadn't intended it as a exactly as a career change. Just the fact that I dabbled my toes in Flash, which I disliked so much. Uh, but people kept coming back to me and saying, "Have you tried TV Paint?" Because it looks well. You were one of them, actually. You you were probably the one that set me on the course to it, actually. Because you were using it for um, everything you can see from here, and it looked very pencilly, which mm -hmm. I was very surprised. Um, and you also said you you found it easier to to do, and you found that you were quicker using it, mm -hmm. and also because I was doing Ethel and Ernest research for for a film that we were planning to make, I thought uh, I better at least look at it. And while I was working at Thing One for Neil Boyle, um, Ren Pesci rang me and asked if I wanted to do three weeks on a TSB ad at Studio AK and be trained by Michael Schliemann. So I met Michael and he's awfully, as you know, he's got an encyclopedic mind. He's very good at explaining everything. So I had the perfect tutor. So uh, within a few days, I was very shocked to learn that, that it wasn't all that hard at all. Okay, I, but I'm actually, I was amazed at how uh, pencily you've managed to make all those things look. Yeah, ah, that was nice. I uh, remember seeing the, the, um, the F and Ernest test and just being like, like if, if you had told me that was, because I mean like TV paint does have a nice pencil tool and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, it definitely didn't hold you back in any way. Not in the slightest, no. I, mm. I, um, I was amazed to... Uh, well, the, first of all, the, the first pencily, the really pencily job was the panda in the, in the, in the, um, the Talk Talk ads. And then I thought, well, this looks almost like the sort of snowman type render. Mm. Uh, it took a while. It took about an hour to do each one, but because but, you had to gradually build up the etching. Mm. But I thought, nevertheless, it gives such a nice broken feel about it that I wonder if it can be duplicated in, in, in something other than Photoshop, because Photoshop isn't particularly good for animation. And then when I saw TV Paint, I saw that they had a few pencil tools, and with the, and every time I think it's incapable of actually doing something that you can do with a pencil, I'm proved wrong. You know, little things like flipping, or flipping from key to key, mm. or flipping, flipping in between wide-ranging poses or even the actual precision you can get from pencil. Uh, it was surprising with a bit of manipulation, how you can, you know, with a bit of tilt, how you can, you can actually do exactly the same thing, which is what I like the most, which is get that blurry, smeary effect with pencil. I can like, turn it on its edge, and you can do that. Really? With, with, a bit of, with, with a bit of manipulation, uh, I've managed to make myself a nice pencil where you turn it on the edge and it gives exactly the same effect as a yeah. pencil does so on the edge. And, but if you tilt it up, it gets more and more precise. So, so you actually have a, a, a real variation between you know, total upright, which is a pinpoint accurate, mm -hmm. and then the more you tilt it, the more smeary it gets. So you customise the brush in it? Yes, customised it. It's so wicked to hear that, because like, you always... I don't know, when you, when you kind of meet people who have come from the more traditional background, they're like... I remember working on a job and an animator come in and he, they were like, oh, do you want a computer to set you up? And he was like, no, 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 I don't believe in computers. And he actually right. said that. And it was like, <laughs> I, I don't, I couldn't understand that kind of logic. And it's, and it's nice to see that you've come from that traditional background and you've, you've, it's nothing to do with like, you know, the, the heritage of the, where you've come from using... Uh, no, well, I mean, I was, I was holding out, I must admit, because I, I like the sensual aspect of, of, the, of, the, of the paper, you know, the, the fact that it grips onto the pencil. Yeah. Sensory. And sensual. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I, I always tell people you ought to make love to the piece of paper, you know, oh, so wow, since okay. I worked on the... Um, so, so. Well, you know, you tickle the paper, it's sensual, isn't it? You know, okay, I don't mean an erotic sense necessarily. Oh, I think this is uh, your experience in France coming out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sensory, okay, if you like, but but in in but the, the, the tactile, kind of, in the yeah, yeah. tactile, in that yeah. in that you you 
it, it gives back immediately what you know the, the actual communication between your, your your fingertips, the pencil, the, the the actual feel of the pencil, the sharpness of the pencil, and and the, and the texture of the paper, and the crumbly noise that it makes uh, is a real pleasure to do. I know what you mean. Like, you, know, like you even just the, the the resistance you get from drawing. Exactly. Yeah. You don't and get and that just that sort of chalky scratchiness and the and the, and a few flakes of chalk all sort of sort of tumble down the page, and then you can smear it with your finger and 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 you don't have to sort of twiddle a knob or or, or, or enlarge it or reduce it. You you have total control over the. You know, if you, at worst you switch to another pencil, which rarely happens, mm. but but it, it, it gives back immediately, and, and I thought I don't want to lose that because the the precision that you get from a pencil is, is hard to lose. And when, when my first experience with either an Intuos or, or a Wacom is the is the glassiness of it, yeah, you know, and, yeah, and it yeah. feels like it doesn't grip, and therefore it, it has the impression, even if you zoom, it had the impression initially that that you couldn't quite keep a line. Yeah. clean enough or crisp enough do you, do you work on the tablet or a Cintiq Cintiq now okay. yeah but the most recent one has a much more gummy frictionish surface yeah uh, and you if you change the, the lead and, yeah. yeah you can change the, the nibs so it has a bit more you change weight. the nibs to the white ones yeah. I'm not an expert in it by any means but, but mm. the, the new the new 13 inch ones they have a, they, they seem to have adapted it it's less glassy it, it has a much more friction frictionful surface and and it, it grips better with a white uh, tip it works mm. better and then with a glove on top of that it it it, it duplicates it quite well actually mm. do, you, so, do you prefer to work that way now or would you prefer to work if i had the choice between paper yeah. and that i honestly don't know to be honest but uh in, in all honesty i would say 50 50 mm. because i went uh, from a Cintiq job to the paper job to the, the, the simpsons and then straight back to Cintiq, and I didn't feel out of place with either one. Yeah, I, I don't see the a big difference except that, except that it does add more versatility and speed and ease of line tests and cut and paste abilities digital. and digital. Yeah. yeah. So, like, if if you had time wasn't an issue and. You know, just for pure fun, you'd probably work on paper, but if it was a... Not necessarily, one, because what I saw you just do, which was work on Cintiq first and then print it out. I, I, oh, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, I did a job for Ardman, a very, very short pitch that never came to fruition, and it was very nice. It was on sale, and it was used ink, uh, oh, right. ink on sale. Wow. And, the, and uh, you know all those sort of sand paintings and those Alexander Petrov things where yeah. he wipes w one image off and adds, adds it onto the same image, whether mm. it be glass or cell or whatever. Yeah. It was done doing that. I had one piece of cell. Right. I, I'd do it on paper first, and then i put the paper underneath the, the cell, put the cell on top of the paper, mm. and, uh, and then ink it up, and then smear yeah. with the cotton wool, mm. and then uh, um, put it on the scanner, scan it, take it off, smear it all off, it, almost off, yeah. add on top of it, put it back on the scanner mm. and therefore you got the sort of shadow yeah. image of what had been before. Yes. But so you got you know what I mean, you, you got um, the you got the smoothness that you get and the precision that you get from a you know line tester and, mm. and, a, and a properly timed piece of animation solid. But you got the, the in, intuitive smeariness uh, of, of ink. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I remember having this conversation with someone where they were, we were talking about yeah, but you know like working traditionally you get like the sense of the pencil or um, you know the ink or whatever process you want and I always just thought but if you want that that's the final look the animation doesn't have to be done like that yes. if you just want the final artwork and then you can print it off and exactly, and artwork yes. exactly how you want it if you want it traditionally but yes yeah so I mean at the moment I was thinking maybe maybe you know the film I'm planning on now I might do it that way Oh, yeah. and then I might well because I do the, a lot of the stuff that I used to do on paper which is exactly the same thing in order to well you know the Prometheus flyovers or the snowman flyovers where you, you're going over a landscape you know when you do a key a key of a building or a landscape and then you hit the next key and then you hit the next key there's very often a jerk Yeah. so you have several recipes you either remove the key or you actually reframe or you repeg the key. Right, right, right. You know, so you either take the key out or, or you, you, you cut and paste it with scotch so that the curve is better. Right, okay. And that's instantly done. 
with yeah. uh, TV paint. You know, you yeah. just sort of select it, you pull and push it. Yeah. And therefore, you're drawing every frame, but, but, but you've got the ability to do even better curves and, mm. and, and more subtle work, which is, which is perfect for the job I'm doing now, which is this waiter who has the most delicate sort of little turns of the head. Mm. And it's just so nice and easy and quick. You draw every frame, but, but you can do these tiny little adjustments, mm. which would take a while on paper. Yeah. So there's, there's a million different ways of going about it, I think, that transition yeah. between digital and mm. uh, traditional. I've seen this really interesting uh, video with this guy, Caleb Wood. Have you seen his tutorial online where he shows how to uh, trace off your digital stuff by putting your hand under a webcam? And draw, and then, and then having like a fifty-fifty mix between the thing you've drawn digitally oh. and the piece of paper, so it kind of saves you printing it mm. off. And you mm. get a slightly, I think uh, you get a slightly rougher line with it. But I just thought it was such a, I would never would have. Oh, what way he's a clever way. He's, to to. but isn't that working backwards? Aren't you? Isn't he drawing? He's done. He's done all the animation in the computer. Yeah. And then he's tracing it off under the uh, uh, webcam in, in, uh, on with a pencil and then right. scan that in afterwards yeah it's I mean there's lots, interesting. Of, got, lots of different the, ways yeah. of learning about it we've got the inklings now of course which transmit you know if you wanted to oh right those ones, could, yeah, yeah. That I haven't sounds, used them but that sounds like a what the, sounds too good to be true it, it seems like a, someone well, told me it was quite good but I, I've never tried it so. yeah I, when it came out I thought maybe like yeah if you could just get a big one and put it on a light so box. we're talking about yeah. like a Wacom product which yeah. is just like a, a yes. pencil that has a little clip on the top of your yes. notebook uh, and then you have a pen which is digital it's not actually drawing I it is drawing it, it is drawing you actually get the marks and you physically draw on paper but it translates what you've drawn uh, on back onto the computer screen. The, the, Have you the, tried it? No, I haven't. Okay. No. So, it, but it, 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 it means that like your artwork's only going to be uh, like on paper. Whatever the whack on pen is is like a biro or something, and then yeah. and then and then just a black solid line in digital where you might. I think I think not black doing... solid, but but I think it does take. I, I get the impression that it takes. You know, if, if it's if you do it lighter it has the same pressure sensitivity and you but can my, probably but my point is is that like the, the, the advantage of doing something on paper is that you can use any medium you want like yes. paint or whatever and the yes. advantage of kind of doing it digitally is yes. that you can put any you can get a million different brushes in Photoshop yes. so it kind of limits <laughs> both <laughs> both of them you get neither one thing nor the other possibly yeah. possibly yeah. yes yeah, I haven't used uh, it but I, I have no particular desire to do it myself mm. but, but as you say it's just another method to translate something that's physically on paper if you're more comfortable with it onto the screen yeah, yeah. If, you, if you've got a sketchbook and you're out and about sketching mm. it, it, oh, yeah, yeah, it yeah. translates to digital perhaps it's useful mm. Mm. Yeah. No. Um, I, I wanted to talk about a couple of the other non-animation based projects you've yeah. done you've uh, done this amazing mural uh, in Anik in, Anik in a bookshop called Barter Books which is one of the most amazing bookshops I've ever been to in my entire life it's an uh, old station which has been converted into a uh, bookshop and it's got like a little model railway going around the top and they've got tons of old books and it's uh, it's quite a lot of charm about it but the sort of biggest and most impressive p part of the whole bookshop is this enormous mural that you uh, painted uh, in, was it uh, 1999? It was, yeah, 1999. It took me uh, two years again off and on to do it, yes, uh, in the middle of doing Prometheus. Um, <laughs> um, yes, that is, they, it's really high up. It's very high. It's about 20 foot in the air. Wow. It's, so it's a Victorian railway station with Victorian architecture. They had uh, a dead patch, if you like. They, they, they've converted it into a bookshop. So you've got lots and lots of makeshift bookshelves. And as you go into the, just before the waiting room area, the, the main part of the building, you look up to the sky and you've got this Victorian skylight sort of cutting across the roof. Mm. And just below the skylight, you have a, a triangle which had been boarded up. And... It, there was nothing happening there so that what they wanted to do was a sort of a trompe l'oeil uh, trick of the eye uh, something in perspective that would incorporate both the Victorian architecture and the bookshop that it had become okay. so it was both you know paid homage to what it was and what it what it is so the owner uh, the owners uh, Stuart and Mary Manley commissioned me to do um 
um, some sort of composition involving the bookshop with, uh, if you like, resurrected writers of their choice, novelists in the English language. And they, they picked, uh, I think it was 35 people or something. And then we, did, then we researched which writers would talk to which writers, how the groups could be positioned and how to actually fill the space up. And then I spent the next two years on a scaffold myself, uh, creating it. I think it was only intended to take, it was one of these things that was intended to take two months. <laughs> and then it just Before grew. You, you it didn't just have grew. enough work on the Prometheus. Yes, I know. <laughs> well, it, 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 it was supposed to be initially in the style of an old railway poster from the 1950s. Oh, cool. So, of course, it would have been relatively quick to do, you know, very flat colours. Yeah. But it became obvious that the more I wanted it to resemble and draw people in and, and actually be real portraits that actually looked like they were living and looking down at you, the more realistic I ended up going. Mm. Uh, plus, at the time, I was very attracted to a girl in the shop and probably dragged it out longer than I ought to have done <laughs> and made her a model for the uh, many, many of the, of the noses and dresses and, and people in costume. So the staff became, uh, we, we had a local theatre club, we used to dr dress them up in the, uh, in the accoutrements, and I often used to wear a suit, stuff a pillow up my jumper, and, and, and model myself on the scaffolding with really? a top hat on. How did, uh, it, how did it go with that girl? Uh, yes, well, I married her. <laughs> it took me eight months. Uh, I had to get quite gymnastic. I had to learn how to climb the, the two tiers of the scaffold without the ladder and then do a gymnastic dismount, give her some scorecards so that every time I dismounted, she scored me out of 10. And uh, <laughs> gradually, gradually over the period of, eight, um, of the time I was there, she, she, uh, yeah, she took my offer. And, uh, <laughs> But that was one of the reasons it took so long. But, but another reason was that it was, it was a lot of work. Yeah, so, it, yeah. It, it looks like a lot of work. I mean, and it's then, very, then very was, realistic. Yeah, I'd always wanted to do... Um, they wanted something in the vein of, and I, and I never mean to compare myself in the same sentence, but they wanted something in the vein of Raphael's School of Athens. And they also felt like the idea of, you know, sort of a Michelangelo Sistine Chapel, tortured yeah. artist, being up a, you know, um, being up a scaffold all day. Mm. But it was very tricky because I had to invent a vanishing point that didn't really exist because there, there was no central point and people would see it from all possible angles. So right. if, I, if I actually created one point vanishing point or even two point vanishing point, uh, at, at, at a very short distance, the whole illusion would crumble very rapidly. So it was right. a particular challenge that I had to invent a way of making it look like it was in perspective from every perspective. And the only solution I came up with was to extend the skylight into a dome so that the dome would work from any angle. So if you look at the top of it, it actually doesn't vanish anywhere. It just sort of uh, comes to a curb, um, so that the line doesn't, the line never breaks. Right. Because it's okay. always going inwards. And that, and um, it's literally the dome that gives that. Uh, it's the dome that gives the illusion that it's that it's sort of three D. Um, wow. Do you um, do you consider yourself to be quite a technical person? No. <laughs> There's so much technical yeah. sort of. I have a I have a dustbin of Trickery mind where I your, where I um, I learn yeah. enough to get me by and then I right. think it all vanishes quite quickly. So okay. we, I learned about um, Renaissance techniques, you know, about glazing and perspective, just to do that painting. Uh, and we were there for about two weeks with various plumb lines that we had to slot in and out of all of the um, various nails on the wall that we banged in. Um, to get all the arcs, uh, we had to do makeshift compasses on pieces of string. Calculate all the eye lines, uh, make an enormous amount of perspective marks, mm. and I could never do it now. Right. So but you it was it. very technical, but but I but I only learned it to forget it again. But I think you, um, I think you your 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 ethic is like incredible. Like the fact that I mean, if, if you've never done something like that before, and you taught yourself, and you, it took two years, but you saw it through, and your film and you know, took ten. Oh no, sorry. Your, no. your the painting took uh, two years and you saw yeah. it through. Yeah. The film took ten years and you saw it through. Years, it? Was it thirteen years? Thirteen years. Yes. Thirteen. Wow. Yeah. People on that. And yes. then you saw it through, and it's. Well, it's total ignorance. It's it's. No, it's I don't that think that is yeah. at all. I think you're being. <laughs> 
I never so, know what I'm getting myself into, but 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 uh, I just have to somehow finish it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, commercial stuff you've done because you've worked on like some of like my favourite projects, like um, the Beatles rock band um, you did with Robert Valley and uh, yeah. who directed? Was that Candleland directed that? Pete Candleland directed it, yes. Yeah. And Robert Valley was his right hand man. Yeah. <clears throat> what was that like to work on? I mean, it's like it's. I, I love that piece. It's so. It's lovely. Yeah, it was really lovely. But it was a, it was a bit of a shock to the system after working on the Illusionist. It's it's what's nice about both of them uh, because the Illusionist, we'd worked for. Uh, I think I was there for two years, and it was the most. I mean, you remember it was the most intensive, amazingly scrutinised piece of work. You know that that, that that you never get that luxury normally, if, uh, whether you call it a luxury or not. But of retake, 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 retake to, to, to the point of chiseling it to perfection. Mm. And you know, you get these thirty-second scenes which you just had to had to hold together. The feet sort of were always in view, so you had to mm. keep perfect balance. And then, and, and and God knows how many retakes we got on every scene. Did you enjoy the retake? Uh, up to a point. <laughs> I think retakes are all right, but uh, if, you, yes. if you do a bunch of retakes and then it gets scrapped or something. Yes, but it, yes. When so you say, sometimes happens. When yes. you say retake, is it literally start again from the beginning? Not always, but sometimes. There, really? there, there, were, there, were, there were some scenes got redone by several different people, weren't there? Mm. But, but, but um, yes, it was intensive. And I, I mean, I've learned to love the retake to a certain extent um, mm. because it, it usually makes it better. Yeah, uh, there probably comes a point where you've overworked it to the point where it loses its freshness. I think, but mm. but, but but generally, you, you, for whatever reason you overwork it, it, it ends up a little bit more polished. Uh, but but that that as I say was a is a rare luxury that you almost never get, mm. and probably I never will again. Yeah, um, and then going from that where you know. That was your next job you, afterwards, the, the rock band. Of yeah, Christmas. well, I left, I left uh, The Illusionist and went the next day on to uh, the, the, the Pete Candland Beatles job. And, and then I discovered, and I thought, uh, they said, we, we, we have this, uh, I think it was two and a half minutes the first part and a minute and a half the next part. So it was yeah. an intro for a video game and then, and then an outro prize for if you passed the various stages of the video game. Uh, so all in all, I don't know, three minutes of animation or something, and and um, and then I, I looked, I came, and I, and I met three people. You know, the, the three people. There was me, Jerry Forder, who were doing the animation, and Robert mm. Valley, who was doing the layouts and some of the animation. Mm. And then in Canada, in his spare time, was Daryl Graham. Yeah. Um, but basically, there were there were only really, if you like, two and a half people working full time on it on the animation mm. and we had a six week schedule to do it in really wow the CG people had much longer and there was a whole floor of CG people there but for the 2D part uh, not much time at all and then it was very obvious the change of pace between the feature film world and the commercial world mm. and it was also very nice to see how how amazingly quickly decisions were made mm. that, that you'd be working in the same room as the director or the director of animation and, mm. and, and they'd be going along the scenes and saying uh, okay well this scene we, we've overrun on that and therefore we simply can't do that scene it's got to be there but we'll have to make it an after effects focus pull or we'll have to oh, just yeah. sort of slide it across or mm. we'll have to have a fade between one key and the next or we'll have to sort of do an after effect sort of movement of the, yeah. of the arm from one to the next um, and, and all these little cheats and shortcuts which you think oh god what's it going to look like but it looks absolutely yeah, fantastic yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it was a master class in how to economise and how to mm. actually um, uh, which is often missed in feature films how to do your money shots yeah, you, yeah, know, yeah. The, you know this, this shot on the rhino's back with all four of them mm. drinking tea and, and sort of moving about in yeah. perspective is going to take us a bit longer so let's concentrate on that yeah um, and then let's you know the crowd shots okay we can use some old footage we can sort of blur it a bit we can mm. cut paste it you know yeah so decisions were made so much quicker and easier than, than on feature films so but but the pace was amazingly quick you didn't have as much time for retakes 
And was it nice kind of jumping onto that from something that was it was, so it, was like, it was like a nice sort of bathing of your face in cool water in the morning. You know, mm. it was it was, uh, it was kind of refreshing because mm. you just spent two years. Well, I'd spent five years on feature films at that stage. You know, right. three years on me and the Migu. Yeah. From start to finish, and then and then just an animation on the Illusionist, mm. and then all of a sudden into the commercial world, and the pace was just so quick. Yeah, but it was a lovely change because you just don't get bored. Yeah, it was it's such a nice project, and uh, yeah, I was going to ask about like working with Valley because, mm. like, you know, his boards and even his comic when you look at it, like. I remember, like, kind of scrolling past like he posted, and it was almost like keyframes. Like, what was his... Was his storyboards quite clear to work from? Yes, yes, and his animatic drawing. In, in fact, he, he really liked you to, to keep, if at all possible... I mean, it really wasn't always possible, but if at all possible, his original layout drawings. Yeah. You know, it's not always possible because a, a follow-through of some hair or, oh, yeah. or something might not quite arrive at the, at yeah. the same time as, you know... Mm. Um, but wherever possible, he wanted to keep to keep his style very much. Uh, so we ended up using retractable pencils. Oh, really? You know, um, because that's what he used, and he had this bizarre way of actually holding a pencil in it, in it with a bent wrist and a, a kinked little finger, and in a way that I don't know how he's not utterly deformed, <laughs> um, or, or doesn't suffer from permanent cramp, because he has the most counter instinctive way of drawing yeah. that you could ever imagine. I couldn't duplicate that, but but once you actually sit behind him and watch him draw, mm. it's uh, it's a, it's a, although his stuff is very realistic and complex and full of perspective, it, it's remarkably quick to do. Really? Yeah, it's a very efficient way of drawing. Because uh, yeah, when I look at his stuff, I you know that's another thing I was going to ask is like shifting to his style because it's. Um yeah, it looks very detailed and it looks it's so totally, stylized. Yes, it is, but but it's it's kind of a mixture of very concentrated areas like you know eyes with you know shadows and mm. blocky eyebrows and a certain amount of little hatching and whatnot, mm. but very empty areas which which are done very quickly with a couple of strokes. Yeah, and if the correction is there, you show it. You know, you might show a double line. Mm. Uh, but because you know, as a kid, I, you know, as we all did, I drew comic books. It's got a very comic booky look. Yeah, Therefore, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really instinctive thing to pick up, you know, for yeah, anybody yeah. who likes who likes realistic drawing, who likes comic books, mm. uh, who likes a sort of a graphic look, mm. and 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 the and the um, and, and the exaggerations work kind of better if you go quicker, you know, right, the, the, yeah, where, the, where the hand vanishes very quickly into a sharp perspective in the distance, and it becomes mm. almost a point right. with a very long extended arm, yeah. and then you can just do a really quick blocky fill shadow. Mm. And um, it lends itself to speed. It's, it, he's, he's very quick, and, and it was very quick to do, which we had to be, you know, yeah. six weeks. And um, you you worked... Did you work with him again on Gorillas? Or? Worked with him three times, I think. Uh, Gorillas, Melancholy Hill, yeah. and Dance Central. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Dance Central, which was, which, was, mm. which was possibly the nicest because it was purely Robert Valley. Yeah. So he, right. he was really... Uh, um, it was very much his style. Yeah. And so now you're pretty much based. Uh, you're uh, you're pretty much doing um, 2D adverts uh, in London most of the time. Most of the time, yes. As a job, you've been doing that for a few years now. Yes, yes. With the odd break for things like the odd TV special, like Snowman and the Snow Dog. Right. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. And how do you enjoy being a jobbing 2D animator? Uh, it's it's nice as long as I'm working, which I luckily have been. But but there's always the paranoia of not working. But really? uh, I do. Yes. What's I like the longest it. you've been without a job? Two months, probably. Okay, that's quite long. Yeah. And what do you do in that time? Not for the last couple of years, but uh, well, um, usually. Uh, work on a reel or, or future ideas or or, um, or move house or um, right. or, or take on I mean I say unemployed you know if I'm if I am unemployed in animation I take on an illustration commission or something right. like that um, but it's been a while so I can't remember mm. but but yes if, if so I take an illustration commission or work on my own film or 
Um, there's been also a, a long-running thing with Ethel and Ernest for the last few years. Right. It's been on the go for six years. I've been only involved for the last you know, couple. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, a, your little tests that's, that, a, yeah. that's a feature film based on Raymond Briggs' work being directed by Roger Mainwood. Is that yes, uh, directed by Roger Mainwood, done at Lupus Films, a uh, feature film based on the life of Raymond Briggs' parents. Mm. It's a lovely book. I really love uh, that story. Yes, one of my favourite books. Mm. And that, that came out just before. Uh, and, and I got it at the bookshop that I did the mural. So I sort of read it just before I was about mm. to start the mural and I, I loved it. And then when I found they were making a film of it, I, uh, well, luckily they asked me and I said yes. And um, So uh, uh, shall be. did working on feature films and things like that give you, bring you more kind of satisfaction or fulfilment mm-hmm. or...? Uh, well, by the end of a feature film, you're usually oversaturated right. and you can't wait to leave. Mm, sure. I think. Yeah, I mean, animated feature films are a very long process, usually, aren't they? Yes, yes. It's, it's, it feels like the, uh, the, the end of the labour pains right. uh, by the end of the film. So, um, y- you're usually pretty fed up by the end of it. You, you, there's a nice middle bit where, where you're just getting into the character. And, 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 and rolling ahead and then by the end you just want to pass on to something else which is the nice thing about working in commercials because you just don't get bored if you are bored it can't last for more than three weeks mm-hmm. yeah so it, it's, it's nice if you're if, you, if you've got a kind of a wandering mind and, and if you if you just like if you just like skipping from style to style mm. and it's fantastic because someone else does all the hard work before you come into it and you just make it move. Yeah. You, you seem to do such good commercial stuff, though, like the, the TSB adverts. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's commercials and there's commercials. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. There's, yeah. I mean, a like, lot of, so. there's a lot of stuff on TV. I got a TV recently and realised just how um, bad so many commercials are on mm. TV and just make you want to you know, kill yourself. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, I mean, so much of the stuff that you've done, I, I don't think it's that... Um, well, there's some Anything stuff to be ashamed of at all. It's, it's well, some of it's. Not, I mean, you know, so many different. What, what's nice is that almost any piece of illustration you can make it move in a, in a different way and, and adapting how it moves. You know, like the Vida Vega ones for the tempo tissues. You mm-hmm. know, the way, where you've got her doing a, you know, literally um, watercolor. You know, ink, ink and wash. And it looks really lovely to my eye, but it's a much more sort of fine arty thing. But mm-hmm. but all of the principles can be applied, but you have to kind of move it in a slightly more, um, well, oddly enough, a slightly more fluid way mm-hmm. to make it work to yeah. account for the extra boiling and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But yes, I mean, you get someone who's a fantastic illustrator, or you know, like Robert Valley, like Vida Vega, or, or or whatever, or like Joanna Quinn for the for the um, uh, the Lou Roll advert. Um, and um, and you have lovely illustrations that someone else has already worked on, and then you just you just kind of make it move and bring it to life. You yeah. know? And so, um, uh, the most recent great piece that you've worked on is uh, this this new Simpsons uh, intro. Ah yes. Um, which I just thought was I, I I'd heard uh, Sylvain Chaume was doing one, and I was wondering what it was going to be like, and I. I really loved it. I really, I really did. I wasn't kind of expecting to like it as much as I did. Uh, the animation in it is just gorgeous. Well, they, um, well, Shomei is represented by uh, Thing One, mm. and there's lots of adverts have been done, and, and I, um, they, they, the uh, Matt Groening wanted. I think Shomei's done one before, actually, for The Simpsons, or done really? it. Yes, yes they definitely yes. referenced him in The Simpsons. Yeah, There's they, an episode of The Simpsons where they do a parody of Belva Rendezvous. Yeah. I think Is that where well, there's the yeah. nosebleed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, right, okay. Mm. Um, right. Um, well, they wanted him to do it because uh, they had Gillen del Toro or whatever uh, to do it. So, so he was the, the, the movie director that they wanted to make uh, a one minute, one minute, nine second couch gag. So uh, they came to Thing One, they came to Sylvan. Sylvan, uh, over, um, over a meal or a drink or, or have several, uh, came up with the idea with uh, Dominic, the, the, the runner of the studio, 
came up with some sketches. Some uh, he showmanified the 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 characters, uglified them, <laughs> uh, gave them specs because I think he, he doesn't like drawing eyes. <laughs> usually they're closed, you know. Right, right, right. Uh, you That's know, true. all the illusionist yeah. people, yeah. almost all the illusionist people have closed eyes. Or dots. Or, or dots, yeah. Or, or slashes. Uh, but in this case, they all had specs too. Um, so they wanted they wanted a, a French version with all the French voices of the cast of the French Simpsons. Um, and they got uh, Neil Boyle to animation direct it. He, uh, it had to be a couch gag, so therefore you've got all of the characters, they wanted a fixed camera point mm. uh, where they didn't move, there's no cuts, and they're all doing something on the couch. So as a result, he didn't do a storyboard, he did an animatic. This was Neil Boyle? This was Neil Boyle. So Neil Boyle... Protégé of Richard Williams goes back to Roger Rabbit, goes back to The Thief and the Cobbler. Mm, and, um, a phenomenal animator. Yeah, amazing animator. Who I met for the first time uh, on The Snowman and discovered how much of a genius he actually was. And he, he did, of course, most 90% of the animation on the uh, the DVD version of uh, Richard Williams' oh, yeah, survival yeah. kit. Yeah, yeah. Because um, Richard Williams, I think, was having heart trouble at the time. But, um, but he... Everything about animation he knows. He's the sort of bridge between the nine old men and the, yeah. you know, the, the people that Richard Williams took in. And, um, so he has a very phenomenally precise, accurate, technical but um, view on animation. And it's the first time I've had the chance just to work him and me alone on something. So that was an amazing honour, really. Uh, so we split the work in half. Uh, he did the animatic. He timed it all out. Uh, so that each character had the little bit in the spotlight. And he took on uh, Homer eating the snails, mm-hmm. uh, Marge, and the, uh, and the dog, mm. feathers and all that sort of thing. And uh, he gave me uh, Lisa, Bart, and the, and the goose, and, uh, oh, uh, and, and the foie gras. Uh, he gave the foie gras bit to a vegetarian. <laughs> to do so as a result I tried to make it as foul as possible <laughs> and uh, yes so so you got Homer you know you got the cycle of Homer eating the eating the snails and then and then I just had to keep um, Lisa and Bart looking this way and that way and, and, and but but with the most precise sort of in-betweens you can you can imagine you know the mm. most precise sort of timing charts you can imagine and every single trace back was a trace back there was no levels at oh, all really? every single time even if the legs don't move at all mm. every single drawing right. was done Neil likes it that way he, he wow. actually he actually thinks it's it's uh, I'm not to disagree with him particularly uh, uh, to animate on one level wherever possible uh, rather than you know any sort of misregistration of peg holes or or, or or any hint of a sort of a oddly enough for his name of, of a boil, you know, <laughs> if, if you, <laughs> he always said it was a bad name for an animator. Yeah. Um, that 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 by the time you've done that, you might as well just trace the whole thing off. Right, right, so right. so and anyway, we we sort of had the we had the time to do it really. Mm. How long did so, you have? We had. Uh, well, I think I had, I don't know, maybe six weeks or something. Okay. Um, At least now there's... Which like... actually was very hard work because because it was, um, a lot of it was on wands. Yeah, I was There's no say, cuts, yeah. mm. y- you know. Um, there must have been lots of lovely, nice drawings of her. Yes. Laying around. Yes, hint, yes. Hint. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have any of them. Oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, it's all on ones, right? Because right? um, it looks no, it's not. It's not all on ones, but right. but where the, the, the nice thing about working with him is he likes it on ones, mm. and um, I mean, it's almost never that you get the chance to do it, and and I don't choose to do it all the time either, particularly. Mm. But but when you know things like when he's pulling the box of foie gras onto mm. onto his knee, or when the the, the 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 goose is flapping and trying to get away. I did it on once, but you know all of all of the stuff that was even marginally uh, fast or mm. medium fast. Yeah, uh, he was. I did ask him because normally people hate that sort of thing. Mm. Well, some people even have rules against it for economy's sake. Mm. But he always he pretty much sort of gave the impression that if we had the time to do it and 
um, to do it, mm. you know, because he did it as well. Mm. So it, it was kind of uh, been allowed to run with it a bit. Like the, the, the luxury of the illusionist was that we got time to, to spend on the scenes, but the luxury mm. of working with Neil on that was that we got the chance to polish it as much as we could. Mm. Um, I mean, unfortunately, I was I wasn't allowed I wasn't able to give it quite as long as I could because my dad fell seriously in the middle of it. So okay. so there was a two week gap where where it, it did get terribly stressful and rushed at the end. But mm. uh, but I mean. I, you know, it does look very nice. I think you know. Yeah, no, I would certainly do. Yeah. Um, uh, I suppose the last thing we uh, wanted to ask you, uh, well, I wanted to ask you at least, was the um, uh, your uh, your short film which you're uh, working on at the moment. Is that something that you can talk about at the moment? Uh, well, it sounds so rubbish. Okay. To talk <laughs> but, about you, but you are working on something. Yes, and it's going to yes. come out. Yes, at some um, point. Well, the, how long is it? The, the <laughs> uh, four minutes, four minutes. Oh, okay. Yes, it's like six, what, six or seven years. Then. I, I, in theory, uh, I mean, I don't think this is a big secret, but but, um, well, it'll it'll be known very soon, and by the time this comes out, anyway, um, it, it'll be defunct or not defunct. But um, I'm going to be the animation director of Ethel and Ernest. Oh wow! For oh, fantastic. A bit, um, and in order to either make myself sane or insane, I'm planning on working on it at the same time. Of course, yeah, yeah. And also, so, um, is is Apple and Nerdist going to be done digitally based on your test now? TV paint based on my it test. It is. It's wow. going to be. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's so yeah. good to hear. Yes. So is everyone having to kit out Cintiqs? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got to get some big Cintiqs uh, in the building. Mm. And it's all going to be done in the UK. If uh, well, sort of yes. That the, the plan is pretty much. I mean, if that'll be achieved, I don't know because it's kind of an amazing thought, you know, with the tax breaks and everything. I mean, mm. an amazing thought that it could be majority of it done pretty much mm. in London. But that's the idea, you know. The snowman and the snow dog was done. Um, were pretty much a hundred percent in house in London. Mm. Which was a rare luxury, you know, that, that sort of thing, you know, not to have to subcontract it to yeah, yeah, yeah. to another country. Um, and I don't I don't know all the details and deals, but but the, the idea was that that the that the bulk of it at least, you know, the hardcore of it would be done here. I mean if we run into difficulties later maybe you never know. Mm. But um, So does that mean that um, a lot of uh, people I mean like as I mean, like, I, I'm kind of making these assumptions, but do you, do you, have you experienced that people who come from a traditional background don't like the shift into um, digital? Oh. Uh, on paper, like, people work from that. So the, do the people that like working on paper like working in mm. digital? I mean, does it mean that in this film you're going to have to train up a lot? Yeah, of, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Convert some people. <laughs> uh, well... To be honest, the, apart from some initial grumbles, I mean, some of them from me, uh, most people that do it, the, the, the grumbles disappear quite quickly. Mm. You know, when you discover... I think it's only a recent thing, though. I, I think it only probably got quite good recently. The, the software. The software. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, to the point where, you know, you can do a test where you can't particularly tell no. that mm. it wasn't done on paper. Yeah. Um, I haven't been uh, using TV Paint for a long time, but as far as I understand, it's been around since then. It has, but, but I'm told it only got okay. very, very good. Oh. You know, I mean, it, everything develops, you know, but okay. now, it, now it's astoundingly good. I need to learn that program. I still haven't learned it. I'll just pick up in a day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I no, I mean, I don't. It, yes, it has. It's, it's been on the go for ages, and I totally ignored it. But, um, but the more I saw it used, and, and then certainly after trying to build my own pencil and doing a test to see if anybody could tell the difference and nobody could. Mm. Um, you know, now I'm sort of totally converted on it, really. But, but even mm. people that, that, that really didn't think it was possible to do something pencilly, you know, when, mm. when you show them stuff like that, they suddenly think, oh, gosh, yeah, there is no difference. Mm. And, and people that have been trained up in this, you know, say, for instance, Studio AK, they do usually pick it up within a day or three, 
and and then they're kind of surprised by how in, instinctive it becomes and, mm. and, and how how quick it, it, it is to pick up mm. you know there's the odd thing where you when you uh, where you um, realize that you've pressed the wrong button but apart from that no everybody's mm. everybody's uh, has been pretty happy with the results mm. that's great I don't think there's any turning back now to be honest um I was going to ask one more thing before we sort of wrap up. Um, you're, you're you're a teacher as well in um, Lincoln. Are you still there? Yeah. Uh, well, not this year. I took a sabbatical. Okay. Because uh, it was getting too much to do mm. everything. I was working seven day weeks, okay. but I, I did do. Um, I taught at Richmond College. I taught at Lincoln and uh, Teesside, and uh, mainly Lincoln, for a couple of days a week. Mm. Yeah. And, and what kind of things did you teach? Would they be? Um, uh, te- technical stuff or um, theory stuff or? yeah well uh, I taught life drawing uh, to the first years and I taught um, things like performance and uh, storyboarding and the, well the whole gamut really you know mm-hmm. things I mean I did a talk on animal anatomy and how to make it move I did, um, you know, how to construct mm-hmm. walks mm-hmm. Uh, lip sync um, just tried to break it down into all the aspects mm-hmm. that I could and just give a sort of illustrated video talk, mm. you know, for an hour or two each week, if I could. Yeah. And then, and then you have to go and look at all the students' work and take them through their final projects or their second year projects. But being someone who is into your volumetric stuff, would you try and teach students how to do that on your course? Uh, well, uh, is that based on draftsmanship? I try to teach them that not not to do the same thing as me. Uh, but, but that that structure and at least the principles of anatomy and balance and gravity and all that sort of stuff does apply. You know, mm. no matter what they do it in. If you, if you if you pose a CG figure, that you have to you have to know how to plant the feet properly on the ground. And and, and even though the figure can float in the air, you, you don't want it to look as if it's floating in the air. Mm. So that so that the the fact that li- I think life drawing was the most relevant thing because because it, it taught not only proportion for the people that had to draw but the, the, the balance and posing and and how physically the body's capable of moving and which part moves in conjunction with other parts you know, mm. to the students so that part of it I, I taught them but after that they're free to squash and stretch as much as they want mm. yeah mm. and it's strictly 2D animation that you were teaching was it? Uh, well, they did. I mean, a lot of them did three D. Right, and stop motion but, and things. And stop, well. No, no, not stop motion. Just three D. It was either three D or two D. Two D being um, flash or or digital flipbook. And how do you find? Um, uh, would you think that the the biggest thing is that people are missing an understanding of as a student in a in an undergraduate course? The biggest thing would be. Definitely not not the sin made by all students, but but the fact that that um, watching uh, constitutes doing. You people know, don't that, understand that. People, that. that peop- some people think that being a, being a connoisseur of um, video games or films uh, makes you capable of animating. Uh, in other words, being a fan of something makes you capable of executing it mm. um, without any sort of recourse to to, to craft. Um, so I, I try I, I try to teach them sort of the craft part of it because I, I try not to influence at all their ideas really, only to hone them. You know, if they had a, if they had a good idea, mm. I, I never ever impose my own taste on it. Mm. You know, because. I have specific tastes, but it doesn't mean they're good or bad. Yeah. But only if they're trying to tell a story, that they 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 tell whatever story they want, but in the best way possible. So so only to teach them the sort of tools of how to how to actually not confuse people, mm. and how to actually structure it so that it it gives the message that they want. Mm. But the, the 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 worst thing the worst thing is basically not being able to draw properly. I think. Right. Yeah. And it, was that something that you found that you could help people with? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think I think. You think it's, it's something that's completely learnable, drawing. Very learnable, yeah, yeah. Very learnable. 
Because I'm. Because you can split it totally into principles. Hmm. Life drawing, hmm. or any sort of drawing. You know, you you. Um, you know, before perspective, before um, uh, Giotto, you know, you, 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 everything was kind of flat and bizarre, and then then afterwards, everything suddenly everybody suddenly could do perspective. It's not that the ones before weren't capable of it; it's just they didn't have the tools. Hmm. But. Um, as soon as as soon as you teach them several shortcuts, you know how to half the body, and, and generally that's going to be kind of hippish area, you know, and, and, and just to make several sheets and then to sort of subdivide the torso and, and how to sort of cast a, if you like, a, a weight from the base of the neck to the feet, uh, how how to make them actually physically stand, how to construct them as if they were a clay maquette, how to make you know if the hips bend one way, then the head has to counterbalance it another way, you know, mm. and then and then gradually you break the body down. Mm. And you, and you just break it down further and further and, and, and everything balances and then you add things like tone you know and each week you sort of add a tool you know first week you add balance then the next week you add volume and the next you add mm. sort of muscle structure you know it, it, it's surprising how quickly people pick it up it's mm. great so I think on I think we're going to get kicked out yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. we're going to get kicked out yeah, yeah. 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 thanks so much yeah, for talking yeah, to us thanks for being amazing yeah, yeah. 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 Really you're, you're welcome good. you'll probably have to edit that down alright take care take care bye bye